Hi, and welcome to Tea Leaves Programming. Today we're programming like it's 1979. So a few years ago, I decided I wanted to learn the Haskell programming language. If I'm honest, I'm not quite sure why I made this decision. I think a coworker of mine was really into it, and it seemed like a really unique language with some unique attributes. Mostly, I was just curious. Now, I had really no intention of using Haskell professionally, and learning a language when you're not using it in anger is always kind of a tricky proposition. I went down a lot of dead ends. There are a lot of resources on learning Haskell, and they are of widely varying quality. Some of them are excellent. Some of them, uh, including some of the ones that people tend to recommend, are not that great. So there are some aspects of trying to learn Haskell that make that prospect harder than it needs to be. And of course, let's be clear, if you're not using a language in production, even after you've learned it to a certain level of competence, you can't really be sure that you've learned it correctly. It's kind of like learning to speak a human language, but never actually talking to real people. Last week, a friend asked me for recommendations about resources to learn Haskell. Unsurprisingly, I had some very strong opinions about which ones were great and which ones were terrible. But surprisingly, I realized, I said, well, surely I have a video talking about Haskell a little bit. And then I realized that I didn't. So today and going forward for the next few weeks, I'm going to try and remedy that. My plan is to start a series of videos where I introduce some aspects of Haskell and explain it to you, probably very badly. We can think of it as baby's first Haskell. You're getting my dilettante's opinion of the programming language, and hopefully you can find some value in that perspective. So before we get into the language proper, let's ask ourselves, what is it about Haskell that gives it this aura of unapproachability? I've identified four aspects that I think cause people trouble. Two of these aspects are technical and two of these aspects are social. One technical aspect, probably the most obvious, is that Haskell is a functional language to some extent an extremely functional language. And I'm kind of going to some effort to avoid the word pure. One, because it's not really true. And two, because it carries connotations that I think are very unhelpful. I had studied functional programming in college. I've done a lot of programming in Scheme. I've done some work in ML. So this wasn't an issue for me. But if it's the first time you've used a func largely functional as opposed to largely imperative language, Haskell can be a little trickier because you're not only having to learn the details of the mechanical details of the language, but you're also having to kind of learn some of these functional concepts. Another aspect is that Haskell is statically typed, and it has some aspects of its type system that are maybe a little stricter or more complex than languages that have type systems but are a little simpler. So even if you've used a strictly typed language, Haskell tends to take that a little further, and a lot of the uglier, um, errors that you'll get from the compiler are all around the type system. And I think that if you're coming from a dynamically typed language like Python, um, this way of thinking about types and using types to get things done is very alien. So again, you're trying to learn the mechanical aspects of how types work, but at the same time, you're also needing to learn how to apply them. You're needing to learn the concepts, how to use them conceptually. And I think that's a speed bump for a lot of people. So those are the technical speed bumps, but I also said there were some social speed bumps. What do I mean by that? Well, for largely historical reasons, having to do with its origin as a research language, a lot of Haskell discourse has a higher than average density of jargon. Nearly every Haskell video by law has to have a joke about monads or a monad tutorial, for example. I think this 
use of jargon or overuse of jargon is profoundly unhelpful to nearly everyone trying to learn the language. This stuff is invaluable if you're doing research, if you're writing papers, if you're doing PL theory, but if you're trying to use the language to accomplish something, uh, very often it's going to get in your way more than it helps you. So as I go forward in this series, there there are going to be times when I am going to use some of this jargon, but I'm going to try really hard to avoid using the jargon for the jargon's sake. Whenever we talk about some concept, such as, for example, a functor, I'm going to try and keep it very tightly grounded in what is the task we are trying to accomplish. This thing should be what it does. And, and that's the way in which I'm going to approach this. The other social aspect, I mean, if you hang around nerds long enough, and I consider myself a nerd, you do see some of this attitude of your use of a certain technology or a system is a badge that indicates how smart you are. For whatever reason, and I actually think it has to do with this jargon issue I mentioned, Haskell tends to attract people who want to cosplay as mathematicians. I don't know how to put it any other way than that. Um, this leads to both code and tutorials with what I consider to be really bad attributes, um, an almost slavish devotion to brevity to the point of pathology and a determination to make code more abstract than it needs to be. Again, we're writing programs. We're, we're using functions. Functions are by definition abstractions. There are going to be times when one has to and one should be looking to make something more abstract. But there is such a thing as taking it too far. So as I go forward with our baby's first Haskell uh, discussion, I'm going to try and keep everything as non-abstract as I can and make it abstract as it needs to be, but hopefully not more than that. So in terms of mechanics, I will be putting out about one video a week. Um, for this series in particular, I feel like accuracy is more important than speed. So there may be weeks when I take an extra week to make sure that I'm getting something right. Uh, I am using a few resources to provide um, grounding and motivation for this. In particular, some of the exercises we're going to do are coming from a University of Pennsylvania course, CIS 194, from about eight or nine years ago. There are actually many variations of this course. You can find it online. Each one tends to be taught by a, a different uh, professor, and there are two versions of this course, one by Brent Yorgi and one by Joachim Breitner. Uh, you maybe recognize the name Joachim Breitner if you watched my videos on the Incredible Proof Machine. Uh, Breitner's approach to Haskell is really interesting. So uh, Professor Yorgi's class is great and takes what I consider to be a fairly traditional introduction to Haskell, it's, it's fantastic. Professor Breitner's course takes a visual introduction. The entire first half of the class is done in a visual programming environment called code.world. And the uh, kind of midterm project is to make a Sokoban game. And this is unusual, right? We've all seen these Haskell tutorials that kind of cosplay mathematics and 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 have maximally abstract things whereas putting your hands and making a game and putting your hands on a keyboard and making something move around the screen that's a very concrete task so i like that as a framing for this class uh, i've written to both professors yorgi and breitner and they've both graciously agreed to allow me to use their materials. Whenever I use their materials, I will put a credit on screen and a link to where you can find it yourself. Um, the way I'm going to structure this, I'm not going to really, I'm going to try to not rely on their lecture notes. Um, part of my motivation to do this is to put my own spin on what you need to know. But there will be what I call lab videos, similar to what I did in the Nantetetris series, where 
I'm essentially going through the homework assignments and doing them live or semi-live. I am going to put these videos up in early access. So typically the way these things work is I will have a weekend and I'll, I'll, I'll make a bunch of videos in a weekend, but then I don't actually release them. Uh, I will put them on the channel in early access for early access members. And this is largely to keep me sane. I feel better when I can publish one video a week. So my standard is that I'm really, I'm publishing one video for the public each week. If you're desperate to see these things before they go live to the public, become a channel member at the early access level or higher. Uh, if you don't wanna do that, don't worry, they will all eventually reach the public. All right, so that's the plan. Haskell as explained by someone who's probably really bad at it. One video a week, starting basically today. There may be the occasional week off when I feel like playing a game instead of doing programming. But I hope you are joining us for the ride. If you have questions uh, or a specific aspect of Haskell that you'd like me to cover, please make a note in the comments and, uh, you know, I can't promise that I'm going to do all of those things, but I will definitely take it under consideration. This has been Tea Leaves Programming. We're programming like it's 1979. Thanks for watching. <laughs>